to you from the all-new Live House in Hollywood, California. Hi, everybody. Welcome to this week's episode of Pensado's Place. It's one of our favorites where we get to answer all your questions. We'll do that in just a second. But first, just a reminder, Sweetwater Gear Fest coming right up, June 21st and 22nd, all on the amazing Sweetwater campus in Fort Wayne, Indiana. We lovingly call it Audio Lollapalooza. Producers, artists, engineers, gear, workshops, and so much more. Dave and I will be doing Pensado's Place live on Saturday the 22nd, 3.30 to 4.30 p.m. in Conference Hall 1. Get there early, get a good seat. We've got plenty of info you can use. Some friends are stopping by, cool stuff to give away, and a chance to answer your questions, meet you personally, take a flick, and all this goodness is free. So come on, we want to meet you and hang out. If you can't make that, one month later, July 18th through the 20th, is Summer NAM in Nashville, Tennessee. That's at the Music Center, and our good friends of NAM have made it possible for the Pensado audience to get in for free. Go to this link you see below me, register at the top of the page, and put in Pensado as your code, and you are good. Dave and I will interview a very special guest on the 20th at 1 p.m. We'll be announcing that pretty soon. So remember, use your code, get in for free, get your seat early, and let's hang. Now, the good part is we can notify you of all this stuff if you sign up for our newsletter, like and subscribe, and click notify, and we thank you for that. That's always good stuff. And now, to our favorite show. We call it Ask Dave and Herb. We do it quarterly. We got a bunch of questions from you guys, so why don't we, without any hesitation, dive right in. The first question, Herb, is can you talk about how to set rates and negotiate for someone like, say, me, an engineer? Um, it's different for where you are in your career. If you're a professional working and you have a track record, that's a certain level. If you're on the way up, like every other negotiation, that's a different level. Um, you set it a bit based on b having marketplace awareness, what comparable people get, your track record of success or not. And because of today and the internet, those rates can be all over the map. Sometimes they include profit participation, sometimes they're not. Um, but it's a wide range of things. There's not one set scale. All right, Dave, it's your turn. DJ Lucky C asks, 808s are getting louder and louder. Is this necessary for a modern 2019 mix? Absolutely. That's like asking in the 60s, is a guitar necessary? Because they're the loudest thing in the mix in the 60s. So in today's music, 808s define genre. They define the essence of the song. So yeah, master 808s because they're going to stay, they're going to be here for a while and they're definitely necessary. Oh, this one's kind of interesting. Zab Spencer wrote, could I write an engineer's version of the infamous Donald Passman, All You Need to Know About the Music Business book? Um, and thanks for your kind words about my knowledge and my perspective being on point. The answer really is, Zab, if you got a deal to do a book, hit me up. <laughs> we'll work it out. Um, I think that there's some a bunch of good information out there about engineering. Um, I think that the perspective part is particularly specific to the person. Um, I can have a fairly aggressive perspective that not all others share. So there are some good resources out there. Um, there are some people who have talked to us about writing books and writing curriculum. And frankly, at one point in time, I was actually doing a book, something like that. And I'll look into doing it again. How about that? We'll go from there. All right. Um, from Alexander Carrillos, maybe this is one we both can answer. He says, there hasn't been a rock revolution for a couple of decades. He feels like music is saturated and especially the rock genre seems to suffer. So what do we think is the cause? And do you think the music industry is going to get worse? Well, I think the causes are multiple. The main one is that in the rock genre, it's a live genre. And, and to have and, and make uh, to have the ability and make live music, you kind of need more stuff than if, if you're working with program music like like say trap or hip hop you can do that at home alone with a laptop but to to record a rock band you need space you need a lot of mics you need a lot of equipment and mm -hmm. so as we've gone into this 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 time period now 
there hasn't been enough rock records being made to sustain the studios that can make it. And so, so it, it, it's, it's a diminishing genre right now. Is it going to come back? It could. Uh, traditionally, a lot of, a lot of, uh, rock musicians looked at the studio as an enemy because it was a live, uh, event. And, um, so I, I think it's going to be tough for it to come back, but, uh, I think it can come back, but maybe in a different form, maybe utilizing more program stuff. And I think it could come back, but they're going to have to alter how they make records. When I think about the rock guests that we've had on, I see that there's more and more preponderance of them using programming in terms of what they're doing. Um, I, there's a couple people that come to mind that specifically do that. I think there's so many outside influences on what is popular and now and what's not popular that that can affect trends of any type. Clothing, musical genres, cars that you think are cool, phones. And there has been a popular cultural sort of movement in the hip hop space from a lifestyle standpoint that has just been pervasive. Commercials, clothing, uh, you know, they're at the Metropolitan Gala. Um, and so um, genres tend to come and go. And I think that there's some interesting rock records being made. I think there's an interesting rock audience stuff. But what makes it popular to bring it back in mass so you know that's different. And it also depends on what you're gauging it on. Are you gauging it on what's on playlists? Are you gauging on what's on radio? What's in top 40, wherever it is. So I think that we now exist in subsets more than we exist in dominance versus not dominance. I think there's a rock subset. Will it become a dominant genre again? Who knows? But that's true of every genre, whether it's country or metal or everything else. So um, for all you rockers out there, keep pushing, keep doing it. And to Dave's point, the idea of now making records and using combined technology should be seen as something exciting as opposed to something limiting. All right, DP, who's the hitter wanted to know, how did you treat the vocals on Mary J. Blige's Be Without You? Uh, ooh, that was a long time ago. Um, uh, Pat Thrall did the tuning. He did an incredible job. You can't even, you can't even hear it. So that was a big, a big factor. I used um, um, GML 8200 on that and... Um, a CL1B compressor. Um, it was, the vocal was recorded incredibly well, so I didn't, I didn't have to do very much. Uh, for effects, I used, um, silica beads on the Lexicon 480 and an, an, uh, an Orville. I'm trying to remember an Orville, uh, which is a, similar to, uh, uh, it's made by Eventide. And that's about it. I sprinkled some other things here and there on it, but basically it was a really well recorded vocal. And by the way, Mary is one of my favorite people I've ever worked with. She's a, a national treasure. And who's the hitter also wanted to know, would I ever consider managing producers? If so, what's the best way to submit music to you? Um, I've managed producers before. Um, I like managing producers. Um, all depends, you know, um, Management is a relationship, so it's not just the music, it's it's the people chemistry thing. And in terms of submissions uh, or getting information to me, pensadosplace.tv, it's the best way to go. Herb, um, what is the biggest sacrifice one can bring to earn a chance as an assistant? Um, I think there's a little contradiction between what sacrifice you can bring to earn mm -hmm. something. I think there are sacrifices you make. Mm -hmm. um, it can be time. It can be moving. It can be working for free. It can be taking abuse. It can be, there's, there's a lot of different sacrifices to anything that you do in life. But certainly if you're trying to earn a chance as an assistant, you're also trying to earn the trust of the person you want to be an assistant to. Um, one of the, uh, another sacrifice that you need to make is, and I don't necessarily know if it's a sacrifice or an attribute, but you also learn how to be in the room, but not be in the way in the room. You learn to listen, you learn to, to interpret, you learn con contextual stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think those are a bundle of the yeah, of great sacrifices. Answer, great answer. Do you agree? I do. Uh, from my chair, uh, when I think of an assistant, that's a paid uh, position 99 times out of 100. And so uh, I think, let's rephrase the question. W w what's the big benefit of, of being an assistant? Well, there's certain parts of the process that you just have to see done to understand how to do them. There's not 
there's not a way you can learn those things in school. Now, an intern uh, has a low pay, if, if any pay at all. And I think that's where more sacrifice is made because you can stick around for several years before you get promoted to a paying job, which is a, an assistant. So those require a lot, of, a lot of sacrifice. Usually those people tend to be people that live at home, you know, so they don't have, they don't have expenses and stuff. It's a young man's sport, but it's doable. A lot of people did it. Karsten Kaiser wants to know, what backup strategy do you, re or do you recommend for project files? Well, first of all, I don't think there is a good one uh, right now. All of the strategies that we have and all the, the, the possibilities we have, they're not, they, they don't last forever. So um, it depends on how much you've got to work with. Me personally, I like to have a backup at the studio, a backup away from the studio, preferably home or somewhere like that, because if your studio catches fire and all your backups are there, it's not going to do you any good. And then uh, third, a cloud backup. That way, um, it, it's probably the least trustworthy, but uh, it can save you, it can save you uh, quite a while. Studies, if you're, if you're smaller, you might want to use individual drives. If you're larger, you might want to consider a RAID. Uh, do some research. The, 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 that part of the industry is changing rapidly and getting better and better all the time. But uh, you got to have backups. Trust me. If you get an opportunity, go to go back to a couple of our episodes to where we had the folks from the Grammys on that whole space of backup filing, proper information, proper data is really critical to not only your recordings being dealt with in the future properly, but also your crediting properly and also you making money properly. So as Dave said, it's an important space. All right, so our next question is from Nige Nige, or who we lovingly call Soul Brother Number One. Uh, he's got two questions. What's the average cost for studio recording time? When is the less expensive time to book a studio? It ranges all the way from a laptop in a home situation with one person as the engineer. Those can go anywhere from 10 an hour 20 an hour. And then that goes all the way up to a major studio like Abbey Road or, or Larrabee. Those can go as high as $2,500 a day. And then all the in-betweens. Uh, uh, you can get a pretty good studio and make great records uh, and compete with, with the major studios at around 500 depending on where you are. When's the least, a day. least expensive time to book a studio? Usually the, the, the expensive time, the inexpensive time is... Um, the hours that people don't want to work. So that would be somewhere around midnight, maybe to six or seven in the morning. Got it. So Dave, this question is from Odriz. He wants to know, would you recommend trying to make it on your own, build a studio and a career in a city where there's not a lot of modern music or move to LA and start that whole grind? Oh gosh, that's a hard question to answer. Um, I chose the first option. So um, I guess that would be my choice. Um, it depends on your, your skills, your abilities. Can you build a studio where you're at? All those sorts of things. Uh, um, I think it might be a good idea in today's world to find someone that's already done a lot of the lifting and figured things out. Go spend some time with that person, get some help from that person and build your own studio. Um, what do you think? Um, I think the marketplace is decentralized. I think long before you take a risk to make the move. Um, some of it is about your skill set. Obviously, if you're going to a place that's crowded, then you have to be better to get above that. Um, so evaluate what you have at home, see what you have. You know, you don't necessarily have to be in the same location now to or be in one of the music markets to, to necessarily work on your craft. Evaluate both and be very careful and specific before you make that call. Herb, Alan Leggett wants to know, uh, technical skills or soft skills, which ones uh, should a new student emphasize in their career? Both. Generally, when we go around and have conversations at schools, um, there's been recently more of an emphasis on soft skills. Um, I think there's an assumption that technical skills are going to be part of it anyways. So you can't have just soft skills and no technical skills. That wouldn't make sense. Um, and the definition of soft skills are things like studio etiquette, listening, networking, storing files, doing some of the other kinds of stuff. Technical skills are obviously technical skills. So I would say that it's a combination of both. And depending on where you are, we'll emphasize one or the other. All right, Klaus Datz, our dude, mm -hmm. he's got a statement and he's saying, are we aware that we have the best bromance in the industry? 
What do you think? Uh, I've known her for a long time, and we've developed a relationship over those years. And um, I, I guess it is a sort of a bromance. Uh, we've had our ups and downs and, and sideways and all that, and we always stick together. Uh, so, yes, I am aware. What he said. <laughs> no, I mean, we've we've heard that from a number of people. Um, you know, what you see is kind of what you get. It's how we are off camera. We just try to be really real and funny. Dave's got a heart of gold, and um, I think he shows that. And, you know, we carve out each other's spaces. But I also think there's a larger picture to that, which is um, if you're in the business that we're in and that you're in as well, collaboration is a lot of what's happening today as an engineer, as a producer, as a songwriter, as an artist, as a business person. So you got to get along with people. You got to know how to fit and so on and so forth. So uh, if we can be helpful in that way, I think that's a good thing. From Vince Fedor, he wants to know, is getting a degree worth it in the audio engineering world? Um, it's directing that to me. And I would tell you that I think it is worth it. It is not the only criteria to having success. We've had a lot of guests who sit to Dave and I's left who have audio engineering degrees and some who don't. But I think sometimes getting a degree has as much to do with what you've learned as it does the discipline that you receive from what you have to do to learn it. That's a soft skill that you then can utilize in your, in your world. But it is absolutely a question of practical learning and also educating yourself. So if you have an opportunity to get a degree, you can. You can self-educate. There's lots of places to get information. But if you get that opportunity, I'd say take it. Lloyd Lobo. What's <laughs> up, Lloyd? He wants to know, how do you get that great sounding low end in your mixes? Well, smart answer first. Smart ass answer first. Uh, the main thing that you need to want to get great low end in your mixes is wanting to hear great low end in your mixes. And then, then it's a struggle of years and years and years to figure that out. We have a lot of great tools if you want to know a tool. There's um, a, a new company called Sub, FAW Sublab. They make a great tool. Uh, Waves just came out with Submarine, great tool. Uh, Boz Audio has a great tool. Um, what I try to do is figure out the frequencies that are clashing with each other, and that's usually in the 40 to 80 range. And then and then you, you, you can uh, side chain a, a bass in order to... Uh, with the kick in order to diminish those. Do a little research. I gave you the kind of the skeleton answer, but uh, it's doable, it's doable. It takes a little bit of time and you've got to be able to hear the frequencies in order to know how to manipulate them. Speedy Jenkins wants to ask Herb, um, in this day of streaming and, and all the different methods of getting your work out to the public, SoundCloud, uh, should you release uh, one song at a time or a body of work, like say an album? Um, I think that answer is different for different people. If you're, if you're not very good yet, you may not want to release a whole body of work and give yourself an opportunity. Um, but obviously you're competing for numbers and eyeballs and likes and follows and so, so forth. So some sort of consistent release of things is going to become important mm -hmm. to be competitive, but you also have to really self-evaluate or be critical mm -hmm. about whether you're in the game or not, whether you're improving or not. You just answered the second question about the, the amount and timing of releases, that that, that, that should be consistent is what you're saying, right? uh, Yeah, and consistency can be different things for different people. So we live in a world where there's really not rules except be in the game. Mm -hmm. And how you're in the game should have some forethought. It should tie into more than just releasing. Um, when you release something, are you supporting that with social media and other kinds of things that you need to do? Um, the one thing that is absolutely true about today's marketplace is that it requires strategy. You have to either be strategic, think strategically, or have somebody who thinks strategic on your behalf to help you. And thirdly, what, what's, what's the importance of having a brand and how do you get a brand? Um, it's oversold in today's marketplace. Um, um, if you just take Instagram, for instance, um, you know, people's handle are almost as important as their name. And so they are constantly working hard. And I'm not being critical. It's just the nature of the game. Mm. You know, they're finding things to post and f trying to work every day to put things up. And they're, you know, and so does that build your brand? Does that make you competitive? Can you then turn that brand into something? Well, a lot of that is what is your definition of a brand? For some people, if you're a Kardashian, that means something different. And it's awfully big. 
for other people, it's popularity for other things, you know. So are you trying to monetize stuff? Are you trying to be popular? Are you trying? So the end game in your branding process becomes important to how you brand. Um, I think everybody is kind of branding, and I think people are branding if they do nothing. <laughs> They're branding them. There's a, and, and actually, I, I gave a talk the other day, and when I got to the part about social media, I also added personal media because everybody is doing something sort of on their personal media stuff that has to do with them being a brand, even if it's not career-based. So you have to kind of walk between those waters. That's a great answer. So Gart Studios would like to know, what are things I can do to better engage my local producer community? And what are good questions to ask other producers to help me gain more perspective as a producer? When I first started, I had the, I wanted to have someone that I could learn with. So I, I got a buddy where we were about the same level of, uh, of engineering, which was mostly zero for me. And he was a little better than me. And that kind of helped me grow. And, and when you learn something, you share it. And so I think find someone that, that that's at, at your same level, maybe 30% higher, 20% higher and, 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 and learn together. And then as you get a little bit of skill, reach out to the community through maybe doing some inexpensive work on your laptop. Maybe, uh, maybe go see, a, see a band live and offer them something free and, and, and tell them honestly, look, I'm, I'm not, I'm not, that good yet, but I want to work with you and we'll learn together. So it's a process. Uh, and I think the tolerance for me was, 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 uh, uh I guess, I guess the, the way to describe it would be low. I, I, I try to do as much stuff as I could any place, anytime, anywhere for any amount of money, even nothing, uh, just to get that skill and just to get that confidence. And you can't have confidence without experience, you know? Um, yeah, I would add to that just by saying, First, assess your local producer community and see what's there. Um, you know, if you're in a major music town, you might attend forums or, you know, like in L.A., for instance, you can go to Grammy forums. You can go to different school forums like Musician Institute or other places. Um, there's all kinds of different kind of seminars and workshops, and those are great places to network. So however way you assess your town, there might be, um, you know, a gathering. There might be a studio where people are. Maybe you start a lunch or a breakfast where you invite producers and so, so forth so you can build that kind of community. Um, you could start a forum, just an online forum locally where you have people pose questions and do whatever. Again, you'll hear me say a lot that strategy is important. Well, it is. And particularly now that you don't have to move, you want to be able to assess where you are, what you can do where you are, and then engage and grow that way. One of the byproducts of doing that should also be either more work, improved work, learning more, more exposure. So kind of be an activist where you are and then move forward. Lastly, um, there's no limitation to you being involved in larger forums. You can be on Gear Sluts, you can be on stuff, you can join Pensado's Place, you can be in our newsletter, you can do other kinds of things. There's places that you can go to get information to become part of other things and see what other questions are being posed. So I hope that answers that question. This has been fun. Dave, why don't you take us home? Um, man, I really enjoyed your, your, your questions. It kind of gave me insight into what you guys are thinking and Herb also, I'm sure. And um, uh, you're a smart bunch of guys out there and girls out there and keep the questions coming uh, and hope to see you soon. <laughs>